Thank you again for having me here. Um, such an honor. This is my first time in, on this particular, in this particular country. Um, I was born in El Paso, Texas on the border of Mexico. So I started out life, actually English is my second language. I spoke Spanish first, just because my babysitters and my friends were Mexican. I have no claim to Mexican blood. But when you, uh, when you hear the things you hear about my country and how we're speaking about immigrants south of the border, you can imagine how that makes me feel. None too pleased. Uh, I was, let's see, when I was seven years old, we moved to Germany. My father was a pediatrician in the army. So I was uh, brought up in Bayern, in Augsburg. For my, my Deutsche, I've seen, I've heard German spoken a few times. Hello, Christos. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful. Um, so by the time, actually, my parents took me out of the American school when they realized just how much trash it was, and they said, "You already speak two languages. What's a third?" And they sent me to German school, and it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, in Germany, education was still considered a a privilege where in my country it's it's you know it's taken for granted often and people don't come to class prepared show up on time they don't show respect to their teachers as people who open up their minds in the same way so education was forever changed for me but by the time I was eight years old I was given a profound sense of the commonness of humanity um, Every weekend that my father was not on call, we were in a car or on a plane, crossing a border, going into a country where people looked different, ate different, dressed different, spoke different. And I saw very young that we are all very different and the differences are amazing, but that we were all vastly similar. And uh, the, the challenging part of my journey is that I was raised like a middle class white girl in America. Um, in my country, being the complexion that I am, being a fair-skinned African-American, makes the experience that you hear about racism seem a little bit different. I have the distinct ability to blend into my surroundings and benefit from what is otherwise known as white privilege. Even though I'm not white, there's a great deal of privilege that I'm afforded. I'm also afforded a great deal of privileges because my parents are both doctors, PhD and MD. And what has happened over time is that I've recognized that the experience that I'm having is not the experience that my brothers and sisters are having, is not the experience that people are having around the world. And I've had a very profound choice to make in my life. I've chosen now to dedicate my life to creating inclusion everywhere I go. That is what my companies do. That is what my, my soul is set on. I could sit and hide comfortably and just have a wonderful life because it is a wonderful life, or I can put myself on the line. I spent yesterday reading this amazing book. Thank you for having it in the, in the room that I was in. I'm learning about your faith, and I, I, as I've come to learn in my short life, um, those of us that are faithful are receiving messages that are very similar, strikingly similar. And I appreciate this about your faith. And what struck me was this idea that the true lover yearneth for tribulation, even as doth the rebel for forgiveness and the sinful for mercy. And this made me think about all of us and our opportunity to enjoy the bounty of God's creation and to, to take care of ourselves and our own and our families and to essentially choose whether to turn a blind eye to the injustice we see around us or to walk headlong into it. And by the words of your own beliefs, yearning for the tribulation and the, on the heartache and the pain and the discomfort that follows stepping into these spaces and educating yourself about injustice and acting, doing something differently, is exactly what your faith calls you to do. And I'm impressed by that. So I wanted to share with you about uh, a project that I've been working on uh, with a wonderful group of leaders from across the United States. So everyone knows, you know, people ask me um, all the time, they'll say, well, you know, America, you know, you guys have a really bad history with racism. It's really terrible. But, um, you know, we, we don't have that wherever people are from. We, we didn't do that thing. Well, I do this work around the world. And what I see is that everywhere you are in the world, the, the nature of humanity is to subjugate somebody. Someone's got to be on the bottom rung, right? And when I, like, I remember going to Australia and I was staying with a, you know, a very wealthy white couple. And I asked them about their Aboriginal civil rights movement. And they assured me that there was no such thing. 
There was no Aboriginal Civil Rights Movement. I went out to Sydney the next day and I walked into the Aboriginal Civil Rights Museum. <laughs> so typically it's, you know, where are the indigenous? Where are the original peoples of this land? And oftentimes the oppressed experience does follow the experience of black and brown bodies. Um, in, in our country we have this weird fallacy where we we refer to uh, people of color or black people as minorities when in fact we are people of the global majority and it's an interesting, and in the previous session that I attended with Hawk and Patty, um, pa um, Hawk talked about this idea that you know, our justice system is a, it's a magic trick, it's a sleight of hand. There's a whole lot of PR happening to make things look other than how they are. So this group of people that I'm working with um, on a grassroots national movement um, where we're looking at at truth and reconciliation, inspired by many of the tr truth and reconciliation processes that have happened around the world, in Canada, South Africa, and the like, we recognize that in the United States we have this original sin, a series of original sins, very ugly things, right? The genocide of the indigenous Americans and you know, transatlantic enslavement of African people, and the ongoing injustice that has been caused as a result. And so our idea is to, we come together, we're coming together in an effort to really educate people about the history from whence we came. Now, I told you in the beginning of this conversation that I grew up in Germany. And when I was in German school, every year from the tender age of seven, we went to the concentration camps and we learned about the Holocaust. And whether by force or by choice, the German people educate their children about the atrocities that their nation has committed in service of never doing that crap again. My nation does not do that. We do not speak about the reality of the enslavement of African people. We obfuscate the truth in our textbooks, we obfuscate the truth in our media, and we are committed to an ongoing campaign to not only disenfranchise um, but just generally malign and create a, a, a culture of fear around black people. And uh, this gentleman over here who I met, hi, how are you? <laughs> you said something in the previous session that kind of changed a little bit of the direction of the, the, the talk today, and that is that we have a tendency as a people to talk about the symptoms, right? What we see happening, the symptoms, the symptoms, the symptoms. But we very, very rarely get to the cause, why? And I happen to be a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, but a doctor of management and organizational leadership, I focus on organizations. But the cause as I see it is the entire framework and the construct of white supremacy. There would be no such thing as black people and white people as we know it had it not been for transatlantic slavery and the need to economically build a nation off of the free labor of black bodies. Before it was Germans and people from Finland and Swedes and you know people from specific African regions, right? We created this artifice of the racial construct in an effort to put some people on top, some people on bottom. And we had a, a comment in our previous session about, well, Christians, I don't understand how Christians could have done these things, right, to, to, uh, to human beings. Well, if we, if we create this fallacy that some human beings are more valuable than others, then we can justify the bad behavior. And so we've done that. But the challenge is recognizing white supremacy as a construct. And, and like a, there's, there's, there's lore that tells us the biggest trick of the devil is that uh, making, him, him believe, making us believe that he doesn't exist. That's the challenge with, with white supremacy is that we are not trained, we're socialized into it. When I started by telling you I had a choice that I could make, I could live a very comfortable life and never talk about this. And I could amass wealth and I could just skate through, even in the United States, even in a racist country, if I didn't choose to look at it. Um, so I will, I'm gonna play a couple of clips from a book. Has anyone in this room read the book White Fragility? You have? Okay, so there's a really good book out there out that, that I would recommend that if you want to go deep into this subject matter, um, and you want to do some of the, the more challenging work, that offers a very constructive framework. So this group of, of, of leaders and I are meeting together about once a quarter and in service of understanding the truth and understanding where it is that we've been and how we can move forward. We're taking these pilgrimages to strategic locations in the United States and taking people on a journey. And our first pilgrimage was to Charleston, South Carolina. 
where we had the opportunity to look at the racial history of the region. Um, we actually, out of 300 operating plantations, not operating with enslaved people, thank God, but we have plantations all over the South of the United States, and they are uh, locations where I don't understand why, for the love of God, anyone would want to get married on a plantation, but they do. It's big business. They make a lot of money. It's beautiful pictures. Um, but they have weddings. They have events. Um, I will no longer do public speaking at events at plantations and stay in the big house. It's crazy. But these plantations, out of the 300 that are currently operating, only two of them actually tell the story of the enslaved African. The other 298 pretty much tell people that the black people were treated really well. They were treated like family. They were given clothes and food and somewhere to stay. And this is, this is a genuine narrative. That is the narrative that is told on the plantations. And that is the type of narrative that is told throughout our, our educational system. Young people are raised in the United States, and they can get all the way to their adult lives, believing that slavery wasn't that bad, that people were treated like family, and that it's OK, which then perpetuates this notion that somehow the, 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 the economic and social disparities between the races is somehow the fault of black people. There is no link, no critical link made between the original sin and what's happening now with every indicator of wellness, of health, of happiness is actually correlated to people's races. Right, so your whether your your wealth, your 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 likelihood of living a certain amount of time, your prognosis with a with a deadly illness, everything changes based on your race and for the negative if you happen to be a black or brown person. So we've taken people to these locations and we went to um, the I think it was McLeod in uh, Charleston was the uh, plantation and actually walk people, and it's a, an inclusive group of people. So they're white leaders, black leaders, Hispanic leaders, Indian leaders, people of all different backgrounds, learning about this history from whence we've come. Because it is through those conversations and those experiences that we're able to see each other as that one human family. One of the biggest challenges is that we have a tendency to be able to distance ourselves from the struggle because we don't have proximity. Like in the, I don't know about the, you know, where the regions that each of you live, but in my nation, we are more segregated right now, as in black people live with black people, Hispanics with Hispanics, Asians with Asians, whites with whites. We are more segregated now than we were in the height of legalized segregation in the United States. And this isn't done through a, a, an official legal construct. It's done through ongoing systems of oppression that have created lines artificially and created social divides whereby it continues to be reinforced. One of the most challenging things that, that I hear is, oh, well, if we just wait for the, the kids, you know, when the old racist people die, the kids will get it right. They, they love everybody. No, 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 no. That's, that's only if you're assuming that racism is a, is a construct that is based on individual action. What people don't understand is that systemic oppression and institutionalized racism is something that is baked in, that is embedded in every system. And in my country, we have optimized every single system in our nation to achieve the results that we're currently achieving. From, you know, from the poorest schools being the blackest schools, being the least accessible for, for further advancement, to you know, people living in, in segregated communities where they don't have resources, to folks in Flint, Michigan being left with filthy water because they happen to look a certain way. These things are done quite deliberately, um, and they continue to be reinforced. So in 100 years, if we haven't rebuilt those structures, if we have not changed the minds and hearts of people to see their brown and white and purple and Asian and everything else, brothers as system and sisters as part of their human family, we will simply reconstruct the same system of oppression over again. So the idea of bringing people together through this um, American Truth and Reconciliation process is to allow people to share the stories of their communities. There are some groups that are, that are engaging on truth and reconciliation processes and giving you know, a million dollars to a particular city, the Kellogg Foundation, some of you might know about them. Um, but our, our thinking is, what happens if you are not one of the cities that is officially chosen to, to get money and get support? We wanted to create a, a system whereby individual groups, individual cities, could rise up and say, we, we want to do this. We want to tell the truth. We want to know the truth. And we want to move forward. And so what we've created was a, a template for 
um, for taking a pilgrimage, for identifying organizations that are working, working on these issues of justice and bringing people in groups to participate in, in these sort of pilgrimages, these conversations, having expert-led, facilitated conversations, because everywhere you go, there are people who are working on these issues. You've got to find who those people are and then connecting those networks. So the, um, we took another trip to, to my city where I live. I live in Richmond, Virginia, which for anyone who does not know, is the capital of the Confederacy. So when the when when um, the the enslavement of Africans was the uh, was was the course of the day, the Richmond, Virginia was was kind of the heartbeat of that. Charleston actually had the most bodies go through their city, but the laws were made in Richmond and still continue to be made in Richmond. Um, thank God they're still technically part of the Union, but that's another story. <laughs> so when the 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 group started with um, uh, just a small, I think there were like six of us who started initially. And what we've done is as we've added pilgrimages on, we've added more and more people who are, who've just been invited by other leaders. You're a like-minded person who we think um, you know, would be interested in doing this. And we're starting with people who already get it to some extent, people who want to be part of it. And as it, like this is not a, it's not an initiative that you can look up. It's not something that is public yet, but it will be. And when it is, the idea, the idea will be that anyone can sign on. But when my, um, my participants came with me to Richmond, we went, uh, we actually took folks on a, uh, the slave trail walk. So there is a, we have, it, it took years and years and years to fight for markers. Uh, where people just bike and mountain bike and they go kayaking by the river and swim and otherwise no one would have any idea. This was an incredibly significant locale and this is why location-based learning is very important. Um, people don't have to start with the history of everything. A good place to start is the history of where you are. What is the role that your locale played in the oppression of people? What is the role that your locale plays in the oppression of people today? Finding that story often means connecting with the people who are doing social justice work of one of one type or another. So we took folks on this walk um, where they were able to experience the, the slave trail walk and had historians who kind of told the story, a uh, very sobering kind of experience. And then we had um, a gentleman join us and uh, kind of brought things forward into the present who was a formerly incarcerated man who had been in prison for 26 years and came out and became um, kind of a social activist because the reality of our nation is that if you commit a crime in the United States, um, whether you're black, white, or anything else, typically what happens is that your access and ability, even if you have served the time for the crime that you've committed, your ability to join the society back as a full participating person is virtually absent. They can block you from housing, they can block you from voting, they can block you from visiting your family if they are in public housing. There are a thousand and one different constructs that exist to remind you that despite the fact that you've served your time and you've done what you were told to do, and no matter how apologetic you are, no matter how much you've changed, I'm sure that, has anyone in this room ever transformed, gone from one place to another, become a better person over time, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe ask forgiveness for a few sins, right? Doesn't matter how, how well you've done on that journey. My country reminds you every day for the rest of your life that you will never be fully American, that you will never be fully human, and that you will always be a second or a third class citizen. So um, trying to create these constructs where People have proximity to the narrative, the personal narrative. Like at the, at the end of the day, the most important thing that we can do is share our individual stories. Who are you? What have you been through? And can you find other people to connect to in that way? Our ability to connect to people, when we meet someone, we're in, immediately we're kind of scanning the horizon, looking for the things that we have in common, right? I connected with a bunch of people from Germany if, you know, at the very beginning of this talk. It that gives us something special, a place, a thing we can connect around. We do that. We're animals. We want to connect around something common. And the, the challenge is that we otherize people because we allow ourselves to keep them on the outside. So the, the invitation I would make to you is to seek people out and really listen to who they are, really listen to their stories. We, as a species, have incredible grace for the people we love, right? When it's our mother, our sister, our best friend, our family member, we have so much time and space for their mistakes, right? For their shortcomings. But the minute it's somebody who we don't know very well, who looks different from us, whose cu customs are different from ours, we don't have the same kind of patience. We don't have the same kind of grace. And that's 
our shortcoming, not theirs. Um, so the invitation is for us to extend ourselves beyond the comfort of our own borders. So I want to stop really quickly and see if anyone has a question before I play a clip. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a few questions. Yes. Um, my uncle, uh, my <laughs> that when, when I'm sharing what, how I experienced in America and with, with his story, I always tell him, Uncle, the country has changed. Mm -hmm. So, but my question to you is, were there better times when my uncle was there? Because I just like to compare how it's yeah. now. So, I mean, it's interesting that you preface that with his relationship to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, because in the United States, typically, when people hearken back to a better day, which typically refers to the 50s and before, right? Um, that is a that is that is pre-American civil rights. So that is before African Americans stood up and said, "Hey, y'all, this is not okay," right? Um, so, in terms of and, and this will be an inappropriate time for me to play one of these clips, um, in terms of white racial comfort, it was a very comfortable time, <laughs> right? And that's what it is. So, so nobody in this room created racism, right? Uh, wait, if you did, please raise your hand because I want to have a conversation <laughs> with you. We got some work to do. Okay, so as far as I know, no one here created racism, right? <gasps> but we did all inherit this sickness equally. And the, the problem of the construct of white supremacy is that it is everywhere. And since the time that we invented race as we know it, it created a system whereby certain people, in this case we'll just say white people, yes, benefited from everything within the context of that structure. And in the 50s, that was a time when being a white person afforded you a good deal of racial comfort Black people were put in a particular place. We you know, knew our place or, the, or the, the oppression of the law was so strong that there was only but so much resistance to it until the civil rights movement, right? Um, and, it, and it just created a, it created a space and a safe haven uh, for Americans and people living in America who happened to be white. So was it a better day for white Americans? Yes, it actually was. Um, but not so much for, it was uh, some, somebody said, I think it was Hawk who said in, in the previous session, one of the things that you, you know, can ask yourself, people will say, like, well, what is it that you would have done in the, in, during slave, if there had been enslaved Africans in your time, what would you have done? What would you have done during the Holocaust? Whatever it is that you're doing right now in the face of overwhelming data that tells us that black and brown people and poor people and women and children are being treated badly, what are we actually doing? The same thing we would have been doing in those times because it felt the same. So the people who had really big hearts, who saw one human family, weren't quite as comfortable, but there was a, an overwhelming majority of people who just want to feel comfortable. Um, and I don't want, I don't want to, I take a very soft approach. Some people don't take softer approaches. I take a softer approach. Hmm, I'm not looking at you, mister. Um, <laughs> I am fully supportive of Black Lives Matter, for the record. Um, but I don't, want to, I don't want to shame you for, for being in a comfortable place. That is a natural human response. What I do want to do is point back to what you're telling me guides you. And it says that the true lover yearneth for tribulation, even as doth the rebel for forgiveness and the sinful for mercy. So it might be really comfortable to keep your eyes closed, to say nothing, 
not to say anything to that racist person when they make that horrible joke. When you say nothing, you are quietly agreeing with that horrible joke. When you see someone do or say or support something that is overtly racist or sexist or ableist, when you say nothing as a human animal, you are quietly conscribing into this system, right? So I'm gonna play one of these little clips right here so that, so that I can encourage you to, uh, to check out one of these books. So let's see which one we want. Yes, okay, we'll say this. As professor of social work, Rich Vaude states, if privilege is defined as a legitimization of one's entitlement to resources, it can also be defined as permission to escape or avoid any challenges to this entitlement. White equilibrium is a cocoon of racial comfort, centrality, superiority, entitlement, racial apathy, and obliviousness, all rooted in an identity of being good people, free of racism. Challenging this cocoon throws off our racial balance. Because being racially off balance is so rare, we have not had to build the capacity to sustain the discomfort. Thus, whites find these challenges unbearable and want them to stop. Right. So, part of the part of white privilege in under the construct of white supremacy, which none of us asked for, none of us created, none of us necessarily want to be a part of, right? But part of it is the, is the assumed right to have racial comfort, right? So when I said the words white supremacy, someone in here got uncomfortable, right? I don't know who. But if you're a regular human, right, right, you could be, you could, you could even be brown like me, and it makes you uncomfortable. Like I, I think I've only, I think I've actually only said those words a handful of times. I think this might only be the third talk where I've said the words because I was scared to say it. I was scared for my safety. I was scared for my children. I was scared for my livelihood. But this brother said, "We're talking about the symptoms. We're not talking about the sickness. We're not talking about what it actually is. And if you want to know what it actually is, that is what it is at the end of the day." Right? So if you are, if you happen to be a white person or a person of color, and the idea of talking about white supremacy, and I'm not talking about a specific small group of people who do hateful things, one of the things we have to get away from is this binary that if I am a good person, I am not racist. If I am a racist, I am a bad person. It is not a binary. Racism is not, is not a function of a single person doing a single act, right? It is a construct. It is something that is, that is built all around us. It is embedded in everything around us. If you are in an organization, a, a living in a community that is very, very diverse, but in the con construct of your organization, all of the leadership is concentrated in the hands of a, a certain few. I don't know what they are. If I go to an organization and 100% of the organization is African-American woman, they also have a diversity challenge and might have some bias you know, where, where race and gender are concerned, right? So it's not about what the demographic is, but it is about the distribution. Are we creating equitable opportunity for our human family, our brothers and sisters across the board, full stop? Is everyone getting an opportunity to be successful, or are we playing into the same constructs that we've always played into? All right, questions? <laughs> I have so many words. I saw your hand first, way in the back. Um, slightly Ooh, controversial. I love it. Controversy. <laughs> and I guess it's just a thought that I literally just had. Um, it's a bit embarrassing asking you in front of everyone. But when, um, it's something I noticed before as well that um, you and some others, when you sort of you refer to this brother, mm -hmm. and it's something that I was thinking, and, and I think it's, it's relevant to racial prejudice but also gender inequality, is um, it's very easy to point a finger and say, the, the, the party that are in the superior side are oppressive. Mm -hmm. We actually forget the fact that we're also complicit. The, the minorities, whether the so-called victims, uh -huh. are not just complicit, but also um, engendering more and more of that stereotype. We're not finding the words properly. But so, so you know, you wouldn't necessarily refer to me as this brother, but you would. Do you know what I mean? So you feel a, a closer affinity to people who are, and I hate using the phrase, but let's just say black. Okay. Um, but are we not making it worse in the sense that are, are we, is each and every single one of us also treating white people mm -hmm. 
as as our brothers? Are we are we not creating and, and actually strengthening those lines of division in having this mentality of them and us? Are we not also complicit in that? So I th I appreciate you for pointing out the construct. Um, so the the affinity. I don't think that there is a problem with the affinity. The affinity is what it is, right? So you know we have this scientific knowledge that tells us that race itself is a social construct. We invented it, right? In order to create whiteness, frankly, right? So we invented it. What's real is ethnicity. Where are your people from? Show me your DNA, right? There's no test for black. There's no test for white. But I can tell you where my people came from. And the affinity of people for their own people has existed from time and memoriam. That's not the problem. It is the otherizing and the holding down of a people. So you, could, you would have to look at the context of my entire life to see whether or not I'm treating white people like my brothers and sisters. I would argue that, in fact, I am. Um, and you know the, the, the challenging thing, the catch-22 of if race is a social construct and it's by and large invented, why can't we just make it go away? Why don't we just call the human family the human family, say we're all human and get rid of it? Um, that would be nice, except that most of you experience me as a black person, right? While I could, you know, I could, I could Rachel Dolezal it up and re reverse Rachel Dolezal, and and since race is a construct, I can say, tell you that I'm white all day long. But the world ain't gonna treat me like I'm white for real, for real. Um, the deal is that the lived experience, according to the racial hierarchy that we've created, is very real. It's very, very real, right? Yes. If I could also add yeah. to the remarks that Please. you made, is that um, I really appreciate the question because it's vulnerable to say what's on our mind and yeah. we need to do that in spaces like this, is that if we consider the way that black people, I'll say specifically, mm -hmm. in any country might refer to each other as brother and sister. Mm -hmm. We know that historically, marginalized groups, even more specifically black people, have had to create informal family networks, networks. for the sake of survival. Yes. Historically, under slavery, where you have families literally ripped apart as it pertains to chattel slavery for black Americans, mm -hmm. you have black people having to literally create kin with people that they do not know yeah. because they are taken away from their family. And so, mm -hmm. The, the verbiage of brother and sister in black networks and even uh, African American networks is an outgrowth of a disenfranchisement of a, se of a family separation to create family with those who you know have a similar circumstance as you. Now we know when we have come to a greater place of human connectivity when we can all be brothers and sisters across difference. But if we are unable to acknowledge the fact that marginalized people historically have had to create kin networks for the sake of survival under a white supremacist construct, then we're not doing the work that we claim to be doing. Awesome, thank you. Snaps for you, boo. Um, yeah, and I would say from the from the perspective of a scientist, if we if we don't continue to acknowledge the construct then the people like me who are all day every day working towards solution and working towards equity and parity will never know when we arrive there if we stop paying attention to the differences my work i know will be will be closer to done when race is no longer predictive of outcome when i put a seven-year-old black girl a seven-year-old white girl a seven-year-old asian girl a seven-year-old hispanic girl side by side and i can no longer tell you who's going to be the wealthiest who's going to survive cancer, who's going to, you know, who's going to be able to have children. When I can't tell you health and wellness outcomes based on someone's color, then I'm done. It's a, it's a wrap. I'm out. All right. Another question? Yes, ma'am. Why is it more segregated now? Um, that goes back to the, the structural racism. So we, it was, we were not content to just think bad thoughts and just be mean interpersonally. We created laws and we created systems that, that further perpetuated um, segregation. So redlining is a, is a, is a very good example. So, um, so once upon a time when, when black people were no longer enslaved and were finally permitted to own their own homes, um, and create their own communities. We actually created communities and they were thriving and we had doctors and lawyers and we were doing quite well. And so what, what happened was 
the banks decided that they were going to start um, designating the value of, of communities based on the concentration of the people and the, by, 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 by skin color. And so they literally designated a community good, safe, and valuable if it was all white. It was bad, unsafe, and not valuable if it was all black, and then the gradients in between. And they literally created red lines around communities of color. They would either refuse to give people mortgages within the context of those, or they would give incredibly high interest, oppressive, um, predatory uh, mortgages and loans within the context of those communities. So the tax base within those communities just, just you know, the infrastructure just deteriorated underneath there, um, as did the school systems, and you created a generational poverty, and you created communities where only only people of color wanted to continue living in those communities. White people wouldn't go there because it was designated safe, and um, not valuable and dangerous. I mean, unsafe. Um, so that's one that that right now, if you look at the the red line designations that were made back in the I think 50, 60s, 50s, 60s. Um, well, those red line designations, if you lay those maps on top of communities across the United States, this isn't a, a southern construct. It started in the south and it, and it was proliferated across the United States. And you overlay them with the racial uh, content, the racial makeup of communities now, it's, it's, it's almost exactly like the black people still live in the communities where we were designated as the least affluent and the hardest to get loans. Um, and so that's affected our school systems um, and it's affected countless other things as well. So many hands. <laughs> yes, here next. I, I want to ask, I once had a conversation with some people over dinner, and one of the white men mm -hmm. on the red line um, had an opinion about his role in society in um, being a bit more progressive in the sense of, so if we're looking, for example, at the gender pay gap mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. women and men. And I challenged him because I said to him, well, if you're a, a white man who has greater privilege than um, a black woman, mm -hmm. um, isn't it your responsibility then to be the voice for those people who don't have the same opportunities? Um, and it was almost like I couldn't get through to him. Was, there was this, um, mm -hmm. what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> something blocking him. Yeah. Um, so my question is, and it was very frustrating because it, it's such a simple thing. You, you know, you in a place of position of privilege are uniquely positioned to be able to, to say something. Mm -hmm. But if you cannot get through to those people, then, then what can you do? So my, I guess my question is, how do you, because you take a soft approach, mm -hmm. like you said, how do you speak to people so they hear you? Mm -hmm. Because speaking is one thing, mm -hmm. but getting people to actually hear you is a completely mm -hmm. different thing. So if you have any examples, <coughs> yeah, maybe that, that would be really useful. You have an example? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. yeah oh. So, uh, so, so I think that what I've seen be most effective is identifying common ground. Um, so as human beings, we have a tendency to be able to find connection somewhere. You often have to look for it, but you start from that place, and Hawk has a really great example. Yeah. Oh, so um, actually, uh, a couple years back, there was a rally in Richmond, Virginia, and it was around the Confederate statue of Robert E. Lee, right? It was the general who fought it. Okay, to keep us oppressed. So we were going down there to stand on the front lines because these KKK members, these white supremacists, were out there with guns. We had in America what's called an open carry state, and that means you could carry your gun out in the open. So these people are standing there with guns like longer than some of the people in this room. And uh, we're just out there with like signs and love. So they asked us to come down, we went down there, and um, turned out to be like three Confederate <laughs> folks down there, right? So that was a dud. So we're driving back to um, we're driving back to New York, and we get lost. The woman driving the car is Angie Kears. Her husband Andrew Kears um, was placed in the back of a police car, and he screamed for his life seventy times in seventeen minutes. And the cop ignored him and laughed at him and said, "If you want oxygen or air." then you shouldn't run from the police. Andrew <coughs> died in the back of that car. We went out to help her. She became part of Black Lives Matter, Greater New York. She's family. 
So she's driving, and we're in Washington, D.C. all of a sudden, on the way going back to New York. She's like, oh, Hulk. She's Puerto Rican. She has an accent. She's like, oh, Hulk. I've never been here. So I always make one up. So, so we're like, okay, so we're here, right? And we're like, well, there is that mother of all rallies here. It's a pro-Trump patriotism rally. And then I'm going on. But you got to understand, a lot of people hide their racism behind patriotism, behind politics. So a lot of times when they wave that American flag at you, it's like they're waving their white supremacy in your face. So we go there, we start walking up, it's about eight of us, and um, people are screaming, nigger this, nigger that, go home, you don't like America, leave, pardon me, my, my, my ancestors built this country. <laughs> Ain't going nowhere, right? I'm here to get my share of it, right? So um, they, they, they say, you know, you wanna go up on stage. We look at each other, we're like, yeah, we'll go up stage, on stage. And, went up and just drew some parallels, right? And we actually changed some of these people in this room. And, 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 and there, it's about 2,000 people, about eight of us, we were about to fight, right? And they invited us on stage and just the power of communication. I was ready to fight. I swear to you, I'm a Christian. When I was walking up on stage, it was like the sky opened up and said, um, tell them who you are. Let them know who you are. So I let them know who we are and why we fought. And um, it didn't create like a massive change, right? But now you have former military people, you have hardcore conservatives from the Midwest who are now listening, who are now advocating for black lives. And it was because it wasn't a visceral message, right? Like they're converts, like how people convert to origin. People converted to the, to the side of justice. And um, I caught a lot of heat for it. But it's, it's, it's about strategy, right? And, and my strategy, I coach, yeah, I coach heat from <laughs> black folk as well as white folk. And um, like right now, nobody's reaching across the aisle. Nobody's trying to find common ground. Now, there was something called Amendment Floor, and I'm sorry, you know, time. There was something called Amendment Floor 4 in Florida, which gave uh, felons, people who were formerly incarcerated, the right to vote again, right? which was denied them previously. So there was a heated gubernatorial race between a black man and a candidate who was a white supremacist. That candidate won. But what Republicans did was come out and vote for this, this bill, Amendment 4, which pretty much made Florida a blue state forever. They just gave the Democrats a million votes. How did that happen? There's Republican influencers who contacted me from that mother of all rallies. So I picked up my phone and said, yo, if a person serves their time, they pay their commitment to society, right? They should be able to vote, right? So organize your people. We won that with 63% of the vote. Find the common ground. That's it. Awesome. I really like the idea that we should act uh, and not only talk about it. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I try to do it because I started uh, in uh, Flanders, mm -hmm. uh, a reporting point on uh, Facebook against hate speech mm -hmm. and uh, a reporting point also on generalizing cultural distinctions in newspapers. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, there are two, uh, uh, there is a homosexual in a park. Mm -hmm. He uh, got a problem with American uh, men, and then they use it. We, we see it uh, again and again in the in the, in the Belgian newspaper. Mm -hmm. He used uh, the rights that we already got to uh, stigmatize a whole society, mm -hmm. and we see that it's coming back and back and again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, constantly report it on up to Facebook themselves. Mm -hmm. And I also file a complaint because in Belgium we have a center for equality and the fight against racism. Yes. And we can send there all our complaints and then they, they go further on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really work on it. So it's not only uh, to talk about it, but act on it. Uh, but it's not easy to do it because I'm doing it in Flanders as one person, the globe. So and I think we could all do it in our countries. Mm -hmm. We could all make a Facebook page and, uh, and ask people if they can report. And it's really easy. You make a, 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 a scan, uh, up building, how do you oh, say it? A screen. A screen. Uh, <coughs> a screen. 
the screenshot. Yeah? You make a screenshot, you have immediately a proof of uh, thing. And it's really amazing how many people do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And not only acts, some people who go very, very far, I invite them to go with us to Calais, yeah. to a refugee camp, mm -hmm. and to see how it is. And we had some somebody from the extreme right party, who was on the list of the extreme right party in, um, in Alst, and she is now our Mother Teresa. She is now helping mm. uh, the refugees as Mother Teresa. <laughs> but she didn't know how these people were. And she had a radical uh, husband, yeah. and it's because of this radical husband that she became a member of this of this party, and that's what the so we can change the people. We can, we can find those people. Like yes. every every community has people who are actively working on these things, and you have to find them. And if, if any of you are like me and are prone to be afraid of one not being comfortable, two being seen as you know shaking things up too much, <coughs> upsetting your family and friends, like again your your book. Not <laughs> Just saying, I'm not saying you have to go this far, but, O oh son of being, seek a martyr's death in my path, content with my pleasure, and thankful for that which I ordain, that thou mayest respond, repose with me beneath the canopy of majesty, behind the tabernacle of glory. O oh son of man, ponder and reflect. Is it thy wish to die upon thy bed? or to shed thy lifeblood on the dust, a martyr in my path, and so become the manifestation of my command and the revealer of my light in the highest paradise. Judge thou aright, O servant. I mean, I don't think we all necessarily have to die for it, but it's not the worst thing in the world, right? What are we doing? What are we doing? Yes, sir. as short as possible. <laughs> that's, that's your degree, not mine. Go for it. <laughs> one, one of the things that we are taught as Baha'is is that, and not just as Baha'is, but religious people in general, is that the creative word of God yes. okay, has many meanings. Um, we are told that the creative word of God has more meanings than there are atoms in the universe. <laughs> and so when we read from our writings, okay, <laughs> The words, meanings, is based upon the context in which it was used. Mm -hmm. For this idea, for example, to be a martyr, mm -hmm. okay, the similitude of a martyr mm -hmm. is a candle. Mm -hmm. And when you light a candle in the darkness, not only do you see the candle, but you see whatever the candle lit up. Mm -hmm. And that the candle is actually sacrificing itself for this light to light up everything else in the room. Okay, so this idea of martyrdom, the idea of tribulation. Tribulation doesn't also necessarily always mean that you're gonna go out and be fought with spears and knives and swords, mm -hmm. but sometimes overcoming yourself yeah. is a tribulation of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Being willing to change. Yes, okay. the biggest one, I would say. All right, thank you. This has been really interesting, very educational. I really appreciate what you said about identifying common ground and drawing parallels. And I don't really have a question, but just what you brought up earlier, that, that how do we help people face these things that are so hard to face? I've been thinking about this a long time. Um, my cultural heritage is so varied. I'm German, I'm French, I'm Nigerian, Yoruba. Um, American, I've grown up in Finland, and like, wow. like, yes. so when, for me, for me, this question of, of um, well, I don't even really terribly much care for the word race. Mm -hmm. I like the thought of the human race, and it helps me come to terms with the different ethnic, ba different ethnic backgrounds in myself, um, being so diverse, and it also helps me helps me empathize a little bit with how really difficult of a task we're asking people to do. We're asking them to please stop and take a look in the mirror. Right. And we know how hard it is to do that with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we are asking people to stop and look at atrocities that have happened in the past. Mm -hmm. That is really painful. Mm -hmm. And 
And I think that, that um, perhaps if we approach this question from, our, from the thought of human race, yeah. perhaps that might be something that could help us to help them, you know, maybe a little bit of humor in the, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that, that is exactly where I'd want to leave you. Thank you for teeing that up. Um, and that is that in all of these, so the, the, the work that, um, that I'm on, the, doing the work that we're doing, many of us that do this kind of justice work, it's cathedral building work. Um, it is the kind of work for which we, you know, we, we, we build on the foundations that those who came before us who were working in the same space were working. Um, I will likely not live to see the day where our human family comes together as one, but it's not going to stop me from doing the work. It will. It will. I will. You will because you're doing that. All right. Thank you. I, I will speak that. I will. I receive that. Thank you very much. Um, that said, the call. You know what I would invite each of you to do. The most important thing that we can do as individuals is do that hard work, that tribulation with the self, the man against man, the person against person within yourself. Ask yourself, how are you contributing to the problem? How are you benefiting from white supremacy or contributing to it? What are you doing to serve and lift up your fellow human? That work, we often wait for someone else to solve the problem because it's so much bigger than us. But if every single one of us, every single day, chose to keep our eyes open and to, to listen to the, 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 the cries of the people around us, and to actually be intentional about the, 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 the contribution that we're making in the world, whether it's, you know, wh where are you sourcing your clothing? Do you know the supply chain? Do you know who was injured? Do you know that your chocolate has slavery in it? Are you, is there something that you can do to lift up another person? Don't wait for somebody else to fix it. See what it is that you can do. Um, and, and in doing that, the quest of going backwards, it's very... It's important that we look at from whence we came. Understand the history. Look at the data. Find your local data. Find what means to you. And while none of us can do all of the work ourselves, when you read about something or you hear about something or you have a conversation and something inside of you goes, ah, I believe that's our spiritual call to action. You don't have to be for every single cause. But if you had some kind of reaction, if something visceral said to you, ah, oh, that's, that's crappy, that's where you should focus. Focus on the one that made your soul respond, and then you can be the most effective. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. You were past time, and I'm just going to blame it on Patty. Because okay. <laughs> that was my conclusion. Sorry to make yourself <laughs> I was raised in Germany by a military man, so timeliness is everything. Okay, so yeah, sorry to, to let you stop, but I think this is an important thing, otherwise I would be so far. Okay, so there is a big difference between prejudice and racism, and a lot of people don't really understand the difference, right. and especially institutional racism. And we can easily say, oh, well, you're biased against me, I'm biased against you, why don't we just go to the oneness of humanity and love us all as different colored flowers and everything mm -hmm. is cool. But while institutional racism, which is oppression, mm -hmm. which is a totally different thing, is still in place, and if we want to yeah. go and just go, oh, we're all one, let's just forget about all that other nonsense, because it's not affecting me, <laughs> and just be all oneness and flowers and all that stuff, it's no good. If you you know, and obviously, you don't have to get pulled into going to war, right. but if you're going to turn the blind eye, you've got to no way. So that's right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.